Welcome to Lipedema Link. I'm your host, Don Ellen Ray, and today we're going to be talking diets and supplements with our special guest, Bonnie Newland. But first, let me introduce my co host, Phil. Hi, Don Ellen. This is going to be a very interesting episode because I want to know what to eat, you know, especially for you, for, for you guys who have lipedema. So, very interesting. Yes, and our guest here, she is a dietitian. She's going to be able to tell us all that information, and she's going to be able to tell us what's going to be helpful for those of us with lipedema. So, Bonnie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, so am I, because, and you and I uh, talked about this briefly about on um, all the support groups for lipedema on Facebook and everything, diet is a huge, huge question with so many women asking about that and, and supplements as well, but diets for sure and the different kinds of diets. But before we get into that, though, let's talk about you and your history and how did you uh, get familiar with lipedema and what's that journey been like for you? Yeah, so I, um, I've, I've always had um, sort of a bottom heavy appearance in my own body, but I never actually thought that I had lipedema. I've struggled with weight loss on and off like many lippy ladies have my whole life. At one point losing over 140 pounds um, and my, wow. Amazing. my body. I'm sorry? Amazing. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, but the lower half of my body stayed fairly large. And as I got older, I started noticing some changes in my legs. Really actually, I, started really noticing changes about 2020. And when I say changes, I started noticing bruising. I started noticing heaviness. I had always had heaviness, but it seemed like it was kind of accelerating. So increased heaviness and soreness by the end of the day. And then I really started noticing a change in the appearance of my legs. And so that prompted me to do a little bit of research and started um, kind of you know, looking for reasons that my legs may be changing. Ironically, I had a friend from college who found out she had lipedema. And even after her diagnosis, I had no idea I had it. Um, kind of watched her go through her journey and then ultimately went to my primary care specialist and found out that I did have lipedema. So that's sort of how my journey began. And I saw um, Dr. Herbst and got confirmation that yes, in fact, it was lipedema. And that kind of kicked off um, a whole new wave of learning for me, both um, from a disease standpoint and then just nutritionally. Wow. So all the weight loss you did wasn't because of this. It wasn't a diet related to this. It was you lost it and then you found out that you had these, these symptoms just became more pronounced. Right. But the symptoms became more pronounced after the weight loss. And I know a lot of ladies that I will see online saying that they noticed that as they've been able to lose some of the non lippy weight, that their nodules and such can become more evident. I actually think for me, it wasn't necessarily that, but I had some hormone fluctuations happening and I think that that just accelerated the growth of my lipedema. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was always there, you know, sort of as an underlying issue, but it wasn't really, really bad until 2020. Did you have a lot of pain with yours? Was it, did the pain become more pronounced? You know, the majority of my pain, I've always been pretty active. Even when I was at my heaviest, I was fairly active. I think that the pain for me was heaviness. And okay. it's interesting, um, as I've gotten to know more about lipedema and the benefits of being in water, one of the only things that was ever really soothing to me was to be in water or to take like an Epsom soak um, bath at the end of the night. But my legs were always heavy. And then and then ultimately the bruising. So those were kind of my two main symptoms. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know I've heard that some women have some pain and some not as much. And yeah. it seems that there's like some swelling or maybe some inflammation, which is a really going to be something we're going to talk about today because there's lots of diets around reducing the inflammation and reducing that swelling and trying to um, treat the ease, the symptoms of lipedema. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that that's where it's very, very interesting. I found out you you actually died at first and then and then found out that you had these um, symptoms. So, yeah, so talking about that and talking about inflammation. So I know that there are foods out there that are anti-inflammatory and that there's diets around 
hopefully that encompass a lot of those foods that are helpful for ladies. So um, if we want to go ahead and start talking about some of the more popular ones out there, some of the more popular diets. Yeah. So I put together some slides here um, after looking online. I mean, there's, you know, everybody sort of has an opinion, um, it seems like, about what diet may be best. And, and from a nutritional standpoint, the diet that is best for somebody is the diet that they can maintain as a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Because if something has a start and a stop point, then it never is going to last for the long term, meaning that when you go off of it, you know, there can be some rebound health issues from that in terms of the inflammation coming back, if you've lost some weight or lost some swelling, some of that may, may come back. So I guess what I would start off by saying, and maybe we can put up the anti-inflammatory slide here, um, the, the main diets are actually, Phil, I'm sorry, can you go back to that first, first slide? I should say that these are the diets that were more popular online when we kind of looked in the support groups. So mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory is sort of all encompassing of many of these. So one of the first things that I want to say is that you can do keto, you can do Mediterranean, you can do the RAD diet or plant-based and vegan, and all of those can be anti-inflammatory. So anti-inflammatory is sort of just all encompassing. It's more about those specific foods that you choose than maybe a diet protocol that you're selecting. And by diet, I mean whatever nutritional intake you have, not necessarily something that's going to start and stop. So I just do want to, to kind of differentiate that. But I tried to add a plate to each of these sides that would show you what the slight differences would be among some of these diets. So with an anti-inflammatory diet, the approach is to really focus on foods that are close to nature meaning that they're not coming in a package or processed, um, you know, or being um, used in terms of adding more chemicals or sodiums and things like that, that can increase mm -hmm. inflammation. So fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean meats and proteins. Another component is some of the fermented foods that we know are really good for the microbiome. So that can be things like kefir, kimchi, kumbacha, which is really popular, um, and even some minimally processed soy, which would be like edamame, tofu, or tempeh. Edamame mm -hmm. is not processed at all, but those would be some of the ones. And then lower consumption of things like added sugars or any of those processed foods, seed oils, which a lot of folks um, say that can cause inflammation from them, um, some of the higher sodium foods, I mean, canned soups, some of the things that come in boxes that, you know, the rice blends that have spices in them are really high in sodium. And then um, dairy products other than fermented soy sources like yogurts, some cheeses and kefir. Okay. So and that's kind of the basis of an anti-inflammatory diet. Well, and I liked your point about if you're going to do a lifestyle and, and include these anti-inflammatory foods in there, as opposed to, like you were saying, just a diet, which may have a recipe, so to speak, of what's in that diet. But I like yeah. that point of just try to eat more anti-inflammatory to see if that will, as a, as a lifestyle, and see if that will help ease some of your symptoms. Yeah, you know what I think happens is that so many times we, as women, and, and I think men can do this too, but I see it a lot with women where we put ourselves in this little box and we say we're going to do this or that and we have these absolutes and, and black and whites about what we will or won't do and what happens with that is that the minute we do something outside of that nutritional protocol or outside of that rule set it starts to erode our self-esteem because we feel like we can't adhere to whatever that dietary structure is so i really think losing some of those terms um, it, when it comes to strict dieting and just saying you're going to do your best to eat anti-inflammatory and focus on the foods that bring nutrition to your body, that feels a little gentler, gent more gentle on the mindset than sort of putting ourselves in a specific box about what we will or won't eat, if that makes sense. No, I like that. That's a valid point. You're right. We When we don't feel that we can follow through, then we beat ourselves up and we lose confidence in ourselves. And I absolutely agree with that. Do it as yeah. a lifestyle 
with the intention and knowing that, you know, you'll make mistakes here and there, but I, yes, I always yeah. tell my clients that when you start a nutrition journey, it's a lot like stepping on a stone path. And if the steps that you have placed are too far apart, you're going to end up with your foot in the mud. And what I mean by that is smaller steps that lead to bigger habitual changes are just so much easier than trying to change, you know, 20 things all at once. No, oh, I think that's great. That makes a lot of sense. Bonnie, do you think that the, the reason why most diets fail is because they're using that terminology? I think what we say to ourselves in our quiet moments and just in our mind feeds into the amount of success that we're going to have because we put these structures on ourselves sometimes that are impossible to follow through with. So what I've seen in my clients over the years is the people that come into it saying, I'm going to do the best that I can and I'm going to make you know progress every week. I'm going to really focus on one thing, whether that's like I'm going to try and have two to three vegetables every day this week. That feels a lot easier than saying I'm going to have to meet the specific macronutrient amount today. So I, I think that that is why diets fail is people try and do too many things all at one time and it becomes overwhelming. That said, I think women are really good at multitasking. Um, and I think that that's kind of our, our natural being is that we're really good at multitasking. And so I feel like when women can't multitask all these dietary rules, um, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating to feel mm -hmm. like you're not mastering something. But there's nothing to master because it really is about progress over perfection. And it's that all or nothing mindset that really starts to get us in the weeds in terms of progress, because it's, it's impossible to do, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it's just so much better to say, I'm going to focus on this this week and I'm going to focus on something else the next week and sort of build on these habits that we make. That's, that's fantastic. That's a fantastic way. And I love that progress over perfection. Mm -hmm. That's profound. And we yeah. are, you are, you're absolutely right. I think that we are hardest on ourselves when we make those missteps or we, our expectations of ourselves are too high. So yeah. I think that's, that's profound. Another thing that I will say is that, you know, and especially in this community, there are certain people that have certain results with certain lifestyle changes mm -hmm. or certain diets, but that doesn't mean that everybody that tries that specific diet or that specific lifestyle is going to have the same result because we don't have the same DNA. So the way that somebody's body reacts to a certain way of eating may be different than the way somebody else's body reacts. That's not to say that there aren't some good best practices and things that we should keep in mind. But what that does mean is that we should look for things that are sustainable for us and not just the lipedema community as a whole. Because if somebody's telling you to eat something day in and day out that you don't find appealing, it's going to be very hard to, to live in that dietary lifestyle for any length of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we want to enjoy what we eat, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's part of the fun in new, in Good nutrition is eating good food. And if you can't enjoy what you're eating, it, it, it's no fun. So I think you've got to find that balance between liking what you eat and having what you eat like your body, right? Be nutritionally help, helpful for you in helping to manage chronic inflammation and the lipedema. Oh, absolutely. And you know how, um, and we see it and hear about it time and time again, this, you know, you just need to lose weight. You know, you're going to be okay. You're just going to, you just need to lose weight. So then when women take that they go and they start tackling it by coming up with some diet or some eating plan and then it doesn't work for them like you said because maybe that's not doesn't work best with their body and their makeup and and they need to consider other things but then when it doesn't work for them then we just end up mentally going lower and lower we just feel worse and worse so i think I'm it's a very glad. valid point 
Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I actually wasn't working with very many lipedema women until uh, April of this year. I went to the FDRS conference in Atlanta mm -hmm. and I met so many women that had been given information or been told by doctors, you just need to move more and eat less and lose weight. And I was like, wow, I really need to focus some of my time on working with women with um, nutrition related specifically to lipedema since I one live with it and two have kind of gone through the process myself. Um, but I think it can be really disheartening when you're doing all the things and somebody's still telling you to eat less and move more when you know you're doing that. So mm -hmm. I think when we take the focus off of, you know, eating less and moving more and putting it more on managing the inflammatory response wonderful things start to happen and mainly that people start to feel better joints hurt less and they have more fluidity in their movement and so i think taking the focus off of the number on the scale and putting it into how you feel is not only you know beneficial for your mindset but beneficial for helping you with managing lipedema absolutely Absolutely. How do you feel about, is there like a lot of ignorance in the diet community? Well, I don't even call it a diet community, but in the alternative e eating community? Because uh, you, you see a lot of, I guess, fad fad diets or fad trends coming out now. But as, as like a nutritionist, do you see like some crazy things out there? Oh, my goodness. I see things and I actually get a lot of clients from people who have, or clients come to me after doing some of these diets where maybe they're, you know, juicing for a week or they're drinking multiple shakes a day and one sense of meal, one sensible meal at night. And I would say, yes, I mean, there's a lot of money to be made right from getting people to reach their goals. And so people will try anything. And I think, unfortunately, when you're looking for what will work for you, you know, you'll, you'll, You'll try anything to see if it helps, especially mm -hmm. when you're struggling with something like lipedema where nothing else seems to work. You're willing to try whatever might sound enticing. And listen, even as a dietitian, sometimes I hear some of these claims and I'm like, wow, that sounds like an amazing claim, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there is no secret sauce. And you have to just do the work. And I wish that I could say that there was some magic bullet, but there's really not. The magic bullet is being consistent. And so back to that whole, you know, phrase of progress over perfection. I mean, consistency in eating healthfully is really what brings on changes for the long term. Yeah, that's impactful, too. Um, so back to these, and I'm sorry, I got you sidetracked on the diets that we were talking yeah. about. And I'm saying diets and, and eating plants, I don't know what you want to call them, um, you know, for that maybe will help with some of these symptoms uh, of lipedema, the inflammation and everything. I know that I saw keto on there. Yeah. Um, Phil, so do you have that up, chart? Yeah, we can pull up the keto um, so I, what I did is I put a, a bowl for each diet so people could kind of see how they slightly change. But the ketogenic diet, you can, you know, Google this and see that there are some pretty good studies showing that people that eat a ketogenic diet will have some benefits in terms of lipedema management because it can lower inflammation. One of the main things with the ketogenic diet is the type of fats that people are consuming. So you know, you see a lot of these ads where people are eating bacon and they're wrapping other, you know, <laughs> other fatty meats and bacon. That's mm -hmm. not the type of ketogenic diet that we want to focus on if people decide that this is the route they want to go. It really should be more natural types of fat. So avocados, olives, more lean meats, nuts, seeds, fatty fish, things of that nature. The goal for this is to kind of keep the overall carbohydrate intake under about 50 grams. There are some people that do it on a more strict protocol and they're keeping those net carbs under 25 grams. One of the, the things to keep in mind with the ketogenic diet is that we still do need to make sure that we have sources of fiber in the diet because 
fiber helps to carry toxins out of the body for one. And for two, it's great for the microbiome and our gut bugs. It really helps to keep the microbiome strong, which is the command center of all metabolism. And then number three, it helps with bowel motility. So we need all of those things. So people that are choosing to do a ketogenic diet really focus on low carb vegetables. So that might be bell peppers or broccoli or asparagus or things of that nature. And they don't consume or rarely consume things that have higher carb values. So peas, corn, potatoes, winter squash, things of that nature. Okay. Okay. Yep. So more limited on the starchier veggies and grains and more of a focus is on higher fat, moderate protein, and a little bit of the, the non-starchy carbohydrates. So how many pieces of bacon can I eat before it's bad? <laughs> <laughs> if you're eating bacon, hopefully you're eating the bacon, bacon that is less processed first off, but it would be better to eat things like salmon or leaner cuts of chicken, uh, you know, leaner proteins. You can eat bacon, but you don't want to eat that every day. So we say so two slices is actually a serving, a dietary serving. So Phil, that means turkey bacon for you. Oh. <laughs> I did no, have a client tell me the other day that she was test. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. I said, I, I had a client the other day telling me she just stumbled upon chicken bacon and she swore it was amazing. So maybe that's an option too, Phil. <laughs> oh, I haven't tried that. I, have I haven't either. Bacon. Yeah, yeah. No, and keto has been around for a while. So you've heard a lot about it just in general. And then when you hear that it also just helps with the lipedema, inflammation and stuff, then that's, that's great. So for those that this works for, and they may have already been on it or whatever, then, then this is great. Then hopefully their symptoms have greatly reduced with this. Right. And, and, right. Then, and then there is, what is the next one on your list? I know that we, there's a few that I see, RAD, and I have seen. Um, Mediterranean. Mediterranean, yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yep. Okay. so Mediterranean diet. I always, I always think it's interesting to start with a picture because I think a picture is worth a thousand words. Because when we as Americans think of a Mediterranean diet, we think of gobs of pasta and cheese. But that's actually not what the Mediterranean diet is. As you can see in this picture, that is two ounces probably of pasta there in that dish mm -hmm. with the salmon. Mm -hmm. So it is, you know, some whole grains um, and maybe it's, it's pasta there. But they also focus on the omega-3 proteins. Um, so cold water fish or um, olives, avocados, things like that to get some more of the, the good healthy fats in. And then lots of greens. So a lot of people may not realize that with the Mediterranean diet, there is a big emphasis on fruits and vegetables as well. But legumes, white beans are really popular with the Mediterranean diet. A lot of um, people don't consume beans and they're such a great, powerhouse of a nutrient because even for people that are eating lower carb the fiber that is found in beans is not fully absorbed so that's where you get those net carbs um, for people that are doing keto but anyway beans can be great for some people um, and then one of the the things that that is really different between traditional mediterranean diet and the way that we have american Mer americanized it is the amount of starch that we add in. I think when we think about Mediterranean diet in this country, we think about a, a ton of pasta and that's just not what it is. We really wanna focus on the lean proteins and the vegetables um, and be more aware of the dairy that we're adding in and any types of refined carbohydrates and things of that nature. Okay. Okay, and then um, next we have is it the, uh, the RAD, which is an offshoot of the Mediterranean, correct? It is, yeah. And I took this information from Dr. Herp's um, website. This is, an, and I know a couple of the um, lipedema surgeons also recommend this diet, RAD, rare adipose disease diet. This is sort of similar to the Mediterranean diet, as you'll see that this one does limit whole grains. So they recommend that you have like a serving a day and they have lower consumption of animal proteins and fats altogether. And sodium, that's something that I should mention, is actually all the, the diets that we're going to see today 
pay attention to the amount of sodium and added sugars. And that goes back to that anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. So the RAD diet is no different, really focusing on non-starchy vegetables as the base of the diet and then adding in some sensible proteins and some lower sugar berries. Okay. And so it's a really successful diet for lipedema. I know it's popular among a lot of the ladies and it, it can be a little bit more liberal, I would say, than maybe doing a more strict keto diet. So it may work better for some people. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have heard of that and seen that a lot and have seen where the support groups are asking a lot about the RAD diet. So Yeah, it's pretty popular and people have had some great success with it. Again, with watching, like I said, all of these um, protocols that we chose today, they all have lower sodium intake. They all have lower added sugar intake. So there's just some little nuances among them. And this one is adding in a little bit more whole grain, but being more careful with regard to dairy and the amount of protein fattier protein specifically. Okay, great, great. Okay. Yep. Then and then next. we can pull up, yeah, I was gonna say vegan Good. or plant-based. I mm -hmm. kind of put these two together because plant-based eating doesn't necessarily mean no animal products. But if somebody is emphasizing plant-based eating, that may mean that they're just increasing their consumption of fiber and minimizing their consumption of animal products. So this can be a really valuable way of eating specifically for people that suffer from heartburn and things like that because um, high amounts of animal products can increase um, issues with heartburn and things of that nature so that's really popular for some people and i know um, i've seen that in the support groups that women do struggle with that um, but overall, it goes back to eating whole foods that are minimally processed. And so that's sort of a theme throughout much of these mm -hmm. diets as well. Mm -hmm. It's focusing on the healthy or the unsaturated or polyunsaturated fats. So that's olive oil, avocado oil, um, flaxseed, chia seed, avocado, olives, and the cold water fish, things of that nature. And then just to kind of reemphasize your point before too, is that these are not the be all end all of diets or eating plans out there. It's to do what works for you and right. incorporating in the anti-inflammatory foods as much as possible. So if you have a diet that you came up with on your own that works for you and you've incorporated those anti-inflammatory um, foods, then, then good for you. You know, you keep going down that path because that works for you. Right, so right. these are just the ones that we see a lot in the groups or have we see women asking a lot about. So just to reemphasize your point that this is not the be all and end all for everyone. Um, right. You know, if you right. have one. I think if you find a way of eating that works good for you and you have less symptoms and you have better lipedema management, then you go girl, right? Absolutely. Um, on that last slide, one of the things that I didn't talk in, about was the vegan diet. And I know that is very popular um, with a lot of ladies as well. And that is very similar to plant-based eating and all that that encompasses, but they don't eat any animal products. So yeah. um, I put those on the same slide, but they are different. So I did just want to point that out. But you're you're absolutely right. I think the the, the best thing to do is just start testing things and see how it impacts you. And when we are trying new foods, a good rule of thumb is to try one new food every three days because sometimes there can be a latent reaction. So what I mean by that is if Bill tries bacon today, <laughs> um, you know, he may not experience any issues with it until tomorrow or the next day. So it can be good to give yourself three days if you're adding new foods into your diet and seeing how they work for you. Because I, I have noticed that sometimes ladies get set on this eating path and they sort of get stuck with their same foods and then they're afraid to add stuff back in. And that, to your point, sort of goes back to some of that diet culture that so many of us grew up with or have dealt with um, trying to you know reduce our body size so then we can have food fear and the goal is to be able to have the most varied diet that you can 
while being able to manage your inflammation and the lipedema growth. Yeah, that absolutely, absolutely. Bonnie, I got a question about supplements, right? Because you hear so yeah. many, so many different things about supplements. Oh, they don't work. You know, you can't get protein out of a, you know, it's just too much protein in this powder. How do you feel about supplements and inflammation? And if you do believe in them, what kind of recommendations do you offer? Yeah. So I always say that I'm a food first dietitian. So when we get vitamins and minerals from our food, we get them pretty much buffered and in the right quantities that we need a lot of the time. That being said, I did put together a list of supplements here. If you want to bring up the, the supplements, um, it can be great. And these are some of the supplements that we know that can help with inflammation. So it can be great for the lippy ladies. I do want to say that supplements are not FDA approved or regulated. So you want to make sure that you're sourcing good quality supplements. But some of the more popular supplements that we know that can help with symptom management is a B complex. I see a lot of ladies taking B12, which can be great, but a B complex is great because as you can see here, it helps with any energy production, hormone, hormone formation, can't, that was a tongue twister, hormone formation, which is important since we have issues with estrogen levels. Mm -hmm. Some of the bioflavonoids are important, and I know um, Dr. Herbst has talked about these, but quercetin and diosamine. Diosamine is sold under the name Vascularia. I think there are some other brands, but that's the popular one. That can help with lymph flow, so that's really important. Another one is turmeric, and you can mm -hmm. get that you know, in supplement form, or you can use it as a daily spice. It's found in a few food sources, which are great, and you put them there. Mustard, which a lot of people don't know. Golden milk, which is a drink. If you like like the chai tea, then you might like oh. golden milk. There's plenty of recipes online that use turmeric. It's nice, especially in the cooler months. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids. This is one you can get from food sources, but certainly a lot of people don't get enough omega-3s. And mm -hmm. so we know that cold water fish like salmon and mackerel and, and sardines are great for increasing omega-3 fatty acids and helping with inflammation. But you can also use one tablespoon of chia seed, flax seed, or hemp seed. It is a little bit different because the omega-3s that we get from plant-based sources are ALA, alpha-linoleic acid, and they have to be converted in the body. But those can be great as well. So making a chia seed pudding or putting them um, in something that you're already eating, like yogurt, is a really easy way to incorporate those. Selenium is a great supplement. And so many lipedema women also struggle with thyroid issues. And so selenium provides thyroid support. Taking two Brazil nuts a day is an easy way to get the amount of selenium that you need. It's also found in some other food sources here, legumes, poultry, some of the whole grains and things like that. Um, and selenium does also help with inflammation. So it's kind of a, a, just a great thing to incorporate. And then vitamin C is, is a big one um, for many reasons, but Vitamin C can really help with inflammation, but it also helps to stimulate collagen synthesis, which is important when you have a connective tissue disorder. It also helps us bind iron. So the women that are choosing to have lipedema surgery need to make sure they keep their iron stores up, especially in between surgeries. So when you pair vitamin C with protein sources, it helps you bind the iron from those protein sources. So that's a really great way, but iron is found, uh, or I'm sorry, um, vitamin C is found in citrus, in berries, in Brussels sprouts, bell peppers, all kinds of things. And then vitamin D is another um, really popular supplement. I would say that in my years of being a dietitian, so many women, not just in the lipedema community, are vitamin D deficient. And so vitamin D is a, a really popular supplement to take. The, the general rule of thumb is 2000 IU a day, but of course consult your health care for professional. But it is in a lot of fortified foods as well. So milks, even plant-based milks and things like that. 
Um, have vitamin D, orange juice is, is another source of vitamin D, but those are some of the more popular supplements, um, I think. There are, there are a few more out there, so if you have specific questions about any, I can probably answer those, but those are the ones that, um, when I looked online, tended to have the most questions surrounding them. Yeah, those are the ones I saw as well. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah. And I think that, that that covers all of the diets and the supplements we were going to go over. Where can folks get more information about this if they want to reach out to you? Yeah. Um, so Bonnie Newland at CraveNourishment.com or Bonnie at CraveNourishment.com or they can just find me on social at right there. He put it up at Crave Nourishment. Um, yeah. Well, I and I'd love to answer any questions. So if I can answer any questions, I'm happy to. No, absolutely. I would appreciate you being here today because I think that a lot of the questions are going to be that I've seen are on these diets. And I think that, that we gave them a solid basis. And again, you know, follow your advice in the sense of do what works for you. Just incorporate more of those foods. And if you're going to do supplements, those supplements, that'll help reduce um, those symptoms of lipedema. But do what works for you. And don't, um, again, you know, be hard on yourself if you stumble or like you were, I liked your uh, walkway <laughs> analogy. That was great. So the walking path, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think what we start to notice is that all of these diets really aim to, to lower our insulin spikes, our blood sugar spikes, which help with inflammation. And it is insulin that tells the body to store fat, not necessarily the, necessarily the lipedema fat. And it also tells the body to retain sodium. So if we can keep those um, blood sugar spikes more gradual, we lower our inflammation and we lower our hunger, lower our cravings. It's just beneficial in many, many ways. Well, I thank you. I think this has been wonderful. Um, Phil, do you have any more bacon questions that you want to throw out to, to Bonnie <laughs> before we go? <laughs> so you said I can have bacon every three days, right? That's what you said? <laughs> Got to get your cholesterol numbers back first. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, thank you so much, Bonnie. This has been so insightful. And I think that it was going to help many of us who are struggling with lipedema and want to, you know, cut down on that inflammation and the pain and the swelling. So thank you very, very much. Uh, again, ladies uh, or folks, just reach out to Bonnie if you have any questions or you want more information. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. We appreciate you. Bye-bye. Yeah, don't forget to, to, to view our website, lipedemalink.com, for all the episodes and blogs and more information about our guests. So don't forget, and we will see you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.